without your goodness I would be desperate without your love slave to the darkness if it was in fourth cross and you have won me with your kindness Chase me down when I was lost. Where would I be if it was in fourth cross? And hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. I was a prisoner, now I'm not. And with your Bought my freedom, hallelujah, for God. All my shame was met with mercy, now your mercy.
Christ is my firm foundation The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaking I've never been more glad I put my faith in Jesus Cause he's never let me down He's faithful through generations So why would he fail now? He won't And I've still got joy in chaos I've got peace that makes no sense And I won't be going under I'm not held by my own strength Cause I built my life on Jesus And He's never let me down He's faithful in every season So my firm foundation The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaking I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus Cause He's never let me down He's faithful through 
Why don't you have a seat and let's uh, open our hearts to the Lord in prayer. He is faithful. He is good. He is the definition of goodness. He's safe. He's kind. He's full of steadfast love this morning. We can pray with confidence out of the depths I call to you, Lord. Listen to my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for help. Lord, if you kept an account of iniquities, Lord, who could stand? 
but with you there is forgiveness so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord. I wait and put my hope in his word. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. Israel, church, put your hope in the Lord. For there is faithful love with the Lord and with him is redemption in abundance. He will redeem us from all our iniquities. Lord, we uh, just give you our attention this morning. Lord, we've all had a full week. Um, Lots probably on our minds and hearts this morning as we sit here, pause to hear from you. And God, we just, we open ourselves as best as we can in our own abilities to hear from you. We ask that your spirit would impart grace and mercy, tenderness to us, Lord, that maybe we can't um, come up with on our own. Would you bring uh, your conviction and spirit? We thank you, Lord, that uh, you help us understand, you teach us. Jesus, it's one of the things you said about sending the spirit, that the spirit would lead us into all truth, would remind us of everything you said. And so this morning, God, as we open up your revelation, uh, would you give us eyes to see, ears to hear that our goodness is found only in you. We bless you, Jesus. We thank you for this time. Amen. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20. Last five verses of the book. This morning is titled, Everyone's Come to Jesus Appointment, because that's what you're going to see in this chapter. This is, if there is a moment in scripture where it describes the moment of moments, the day of days where, and you may have had that, your mom or dad may have been uh, clever, cheeky in their comment to you when you did something and saying, hey, we need to have a come to Jesus moment. And a conversation, usually that's a, it's code for, we need to have a serious reckoning, a serious conversation. This is the come to Jesus moment for everybody in the world. Think about it. Past, present, future, yet to be born. Everybody that's anybody that's ever taken a breath on this planet will stand before the Lord. And so that's what we're going to read about. So we'll just jump right into verse 11, chapter 20, then I saw a great white throne and one seated on it. Earth and heaven fled from his presence, running. <laughs> like, think about that. It was just what he's trying to say here. Earth and heaven fled from his presence and no place was found for them to go. I was in my 20s, I was living in North Carolina, I was a pastor, and I was speeding, maybe. (laughs) Either way, this uh, North Carolina cop pulled me over, gave me a ticket, no pleading, no, uh, I'm so young, oh, just please be not, no, he just, he wrote it up. And it was one of those where, you know, nowadays you could do, where you could send in the fine or whatever, but this one was you had to appear in court. You had to be there. And it was in this little town. It wasn't even in the town I lived in. And so I had to drive from where I was living in Charlotte to this little podunk town somewhere between Knoxville and Charlotte in the middle of North Carolina to go to this hick courtroom. And I remember being so annoyed at this. It was a nuisance. It took up my time. I didn't want to be in the courtroom. It brought anxiety and frustration. It was the first time. And as I sat there, it went from nuisance to dread. And I was by myself. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of cases. Of course, mine wasn't first. I'm sitting there over an hour. And I felt so alone. And there's nobody there that knows me. You know, you ask the question and it's like, it's like they don't want to be there either. 
And the people are like, yeah, sit over there. Rah, rah, rah. You're just like, okay, okay. And so everybody's kind of in this, everybody's just like balled up like this, inside and out. Eventually, my case gets called. And I have to stand in front of all these people and stand in front of this judge. And Charles Henry Ellenberg Jr. Yeah, that's my full name. Isn't that weird? Um, you have been charged with blah, 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 da, 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 da. How do you plead? Um, guilty. It's the weirdest thing. Guilty. All that, I had to, even though I was going to do that, I couldn't just send in the money. I had to stand there. I had to say it. I had to feel it. Had to be in front of this. Guilty, your honor. Yet, in many ways, it's kind of a boring story, isn't it? You're like, oh, tough. That's, that's tough. Traffic court. That was pretty hard, huh? <laughs> Something that interrupted regular life. You may have had a similar situation. Anybody been pulled over? Don't answer. <laughs> We, we've all been in, or you, like, who has not been driving, you know, on 90, and you drive, and there's the one guy parked there, and you're like, you know, if you're with somebody, like, so Lisa with me, she's like, cop, 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 you know, and you're like, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm good, I'm good, actually. <laughs> you just have that moment of panic, you're, and then you, you pass them, and what do you do? You look in the mirror, and you're like, don't, don't, don't you do it, don't you do it, and then you're like, Thank you. Because I don't want the nuisance. I don't want the pain of having to stand in front of somebody or answer. But it's still boring. Traffic, stop. Pay the fine, whatever. It's kind of dull as far as stories go. This is far from the case in Revelation 20, verse 11. This is not your average boring traffic court appearance. E.M. Forrester, great author, talks about the difference between narrative and plot. Narrative is traffic court. Narrative is the king died and then the queen died. You're like, okay. But plot is the king died and then the queen died of grief. Oh, now that's a story, isn't it? exactly what's happening here. So let's do it with our story. Boring narrative, Chad went to traffic court in North Carolina. Thrilling plot, Chad stood before his creator, the king of kings, the judge of everyone and everything, and his life, every thought, action, inaction was laid bare, and God decided his fate. Whew. That's a little more intense, isn't it? That's a story, but it's not fictional. That's my story. That's your story. That's what Revelation 20 wants you to feel. This is my story. This is no backwoods courtroom in North Carolina with some hick judge. This is a great white throne and one seated on it. So a simple question for us as we consider the throne. Where am I standing? I just want you to ask that question. Where are you? And it's good to imagine. That's what John is inviting us to do. That's what the Spirit is inviting us to do with apocalyptic literature is to imagine yourself there. Feel what you would feel. My prayer for us this morning already has been for the Spirit to give us understanding, awareness, and a gut level, oh my goodness, this is real, reaction. That's what we need when we read God's Word. So I want you to let that first question just sit in your imagination, even the whole time, even if you kind of tune me out. And if you are thinking about standing there before God, good, good. Let it, because it's your come to Jesus moment, let it sit there. This isn't a boring narrative. This is your story. This is my story. This is every human being that's ever lived. Our plot finds its peak moment right here. It all leads to this. How do you feel about this future moment? What does it compel you to do? What's it, what reaction does it cause? Earth and heaven decided to run. 
It fled from his presence. That's how it responded. Earth and heaven. So what's obviously, so this is where we put on our imaginative, apocalyptic understanding. Hopefully you've been getting some of those tools and skills as we've learned to read Revelation. But when he says earth and heaven, you're like, oh, well, so not literally like the globe. Not literally, like, what's he trying to say? Everyone that stood in front of God's presence, his glory, his majesty, his holiness said, ah, we got to go. We've got to get out of here. But there's nowhere to go. Psalm 139, if I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. Psalm 90, verse 8, you've set our sins before you. Our secret sins are in the light of your presence. Luke 12, there's nothing covered that won't be uncovered, nothing hidden that won't be made known. Hebrews 4, the word of God is living, and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No creature is hidden from him. All things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Doesn't mean we won't try, though. You ever try to run from the Lord? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Even if it's just in your mind. Even if it's just in something that you do to cope or to get the thoughts out of your head. We love to run. It's part of our fallen condition. Get me out of here. We don't see things as they are. We're unable to perceive reality. Revelation is about seeing things as they are. And we think sometimes, you know what? I got away with it. Whew, I passed him. He's in the rearview mirror. He's not going to. Yes, he didn't turn on the lights. Maybe I'll slip by the Lord. Now that's simple. It doesn't get to this huge weighty thing because we're kind of like, okay, okay, you know, yeah, I'm going to stand before the Lord one day. So let's go to like a big case, something in our world that we understand. A guy named Adolf Eichmann. Let me show you. And I actually scrubbed away his insignia because I don't think you should give that stuff any airtime from that. To, but we know who he was. This guy, uh, let's just talk about, though, his life before we knew this part. Great career. Actually boring. He was a salesman. Traveling salesman for an oil company. Got laid off in the Depression. Worked his way up. And was smart. He was a family man. He ended up in the inner circle of some of the most powerful people in the world at the time. One major problem, his savvy and his skill set allowed him to be someone that they would look to to come up with a solution for the Jewish people. So Adolf Eichmann came up with the final solution. We will identify all the Jews. We will assemble all the Jews, gather them up and send them to camps to deal with them. Oh, is that all? Yeah. And he got away with it for a while until 1958. He lived under false identity in Germany for a while. Italy, Austria made his way to Argentina, working in a Mercedes Benz factory. 1958, Mossad agents from Israel track him down and bring him back to Jerusalem. Uh, the irony there is interesting, I think, <laughs> to Jerusalem to face the charges. And the whole world's watching this. Imagine his trial had 112 witnesses, 56 days, thousands of documents. His defense, I was just following orders. Like everybody else at Nuremberg as well, just following orders. But judgment was passed. He was guilty. He appealed to the Israeli Supreme Court. His defense team argued this, Israel's jurisdiction and the legality of their laws, since they were a country that was only a few years old, do not apply to me. I am out of your jurisdiction. I don't recognize your laws. Therefore, you can't convict me. The Israeli Supreme Court said, wrong, <laughs> wrong. 
And Eichmann was guilty and hanged in Tel Aviv. Why is this interesting? Because it's the same dis defense most of humanity currently uses to reject God's authority. God, you do not have jurisdiction or official power to make legal decisions for my life. I self-select out. I don't recognize your authority. I'm outside of it. Therefore, your laws do not apply to me. We try similar tactics that we have come to understand in our 21st century legal system. You hear things like this. Just don't say anything. Don't incriminate yourself. Don't you say it. What you hear say that on all the TV shows with attorneys. Somebody gets in trouble. What's the first thing their attorney says? Don't say anything. How does that go over with the Lord? He doesn't need you to speak. <laughs> he knows it all. It's all laid bare, just like the scripture tells us. Or they try this one. You aren't allowed to speak to my client. You don't have the right. I'm not letting you. God already has all the evidence. He can speak to whoever he wants. That evidence is inadmissible. Everything is admissible. It's all known. That witness is not allowed. I discredit that witness. Is this, think about this. These are our tactics. This guy's like a slam dunk. He knows all this stuff. And they bring him in here. They're like, oh, can you really be trusted? He's a liar though. Court will disregard so-and-so's testimony because of the past history of not telling the truth. But it's the truth. It doesn't matter. God says, I have all the evidence. I know the truth. And the amazing thing about our own culpability when it comes to sin and standing before the Lord is your own spirit tells you on a daily basis, yes, you're guilty. Right? At most of us will not argue with that. It is there. We may numb it. We may push it out. But inside, we have this part of us. And guess what? It's the mercy of the Holy Spirit that is convicting us of our sin, saying, yes, yes, you need help. Yes, you need representation. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Since we can't run or hide, then let's go back to the question. Where are you standing? Because you will be there. Where are you standing? I have a place. I can see my place in the throne room. I actually go to it often in my imagination and worship. Can I tell you where it is? It is just to the left and behind the throne. I can see the, the edge of his garment. I can see his hand resting on the throne. And I'm back here. And I'm like a kid who's kind of just running around. I'm not afraid. I'm not anxious. I'm not worried. I'm not standing out there. <laughs> I'm like, dun, da, 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 da. <laughs> like that famous picture, you guys have probably seen that of John F. Kennedy and little JFK under the desk. He's in there like making decisions as the president of the United States and he's like under the desk playing. Just kind of feel this place of peace and I can look out and I see this in my imagination, billions of people standing before him some cheering and yelling his name, others afraid. Afraid. It's a centering, grounding image for me. It's an image where I get caught up in worship and exhilaration. It brings hope and longing, not dread and fear. I'm a kid playing around the throne. I'm not afraid. It's safe. There are reasons for my confidence. There are reasons for my peace in that place. It's because I have an advocate. I have representation. I have the best representation. And I do need him to speak for me. Let's see why. Verse 12. I also saw the dead, the great and the small. That's scripture's way of telling you that it didn't matter what you did in this life. It doesn't matter if you made tons of money or you won the Pulitzer you know, Prize. Like, 
everybody, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by what was written in the books. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. That part always gets my weird imagination working. And I'm like, like if a fish ate a person, ugh. whatever. But I, I do think about that kind of stuff. Like some people, the resurrection is going to be a little more difficult. Like for some, God's like, oh, oh, good. I'm glad all the parts are still in that little box in the ground. That guy, he was eaten by a shark. I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> no, just, but that's what I do when I, when I read scripture. You got to let your mind get a little creative and imaginative. <laughs> the sea gave up the dead. It's the scripture's symbolic way of saying nothing, nobody, dead everywhere. Anybody that was dead gave it up. Also remember that the sea is a place of chaos in scripture. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. Death and Hades are personified descriptions of enemies of God. Just keep that in your mind, okay? Now, they're a, real, a reality as well, but personified enemies of God. That's what Revelation is doing with those, those two things there. And each one was judged according to their works. So God is the original storyteller. When I think about books, I think about stories. I think about stories. When he writes a story, I have a hard time believing that it's just a list of names with a set of check boxes next to them. Yes or no. Is that, is the God who made the universe, who has wisdom profound beyond anything we could ever imagine, who could run circles around even our deepest philosophical arguments, is that God the one that has a book that's like, Chad, yes or no? Okay, you're good. Is that what he does? Is that, or, but think about, I want you to think about that because sometimes we reduce it to that. When he says the name just written, is that what it means? Well, Oh, okay. You made it. Good job. Go ahead. Is that how simple it is? I think about books. I think about stories. Are we really to believe that following Jesus amounts to a mark on a page? A check mark in a column? Yes or no? I don't think so. How about a book of cold, hard evidence to levy against us when everything hits the fan? We read these verses, we imagine God carrying around a score sheet or a grade book where you're always one mark away from failing. I just imagine him like looking at your life and checking you out tomorrow on Monday, October 2nd, seeing how you do, how your thoughts were. Did you let that curse word fly? <gasps> I got that. Mm -hmm. He's writing, he's writing, and all of a sudden you have a really bad moment and you, you see him writing and you're like, what are you, what, what are you writing? <laughs> what are you writing? Is it good? Is it bad? What are you writing about me? We have a place of anxious fear and we wonder what our position before God might be. doesn't mean we shouldn't ask what he's writing. And though this description of books is symbolic and metaphorical. Remember, they always refer to something real though. I do believe there's a record. So let's think about the books. What do they say about me? What do they say about you? You gotta let yourself go to these places when you interact with God's word. What do those books say about you? If God has a book of life, then I have to believe it is his most treasured book. His, he desires that no one should perish. Scripture tells us there will be those who do, but his desire and his heart is that none should perish. He loves everyone deeply. So what's written in the book? Psalm 56, 8. You yourself have recorded my wanderings. Put your tears, put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? It's God's record of us, his following of our lives. I like to go first to this because we go to just the check mark and the list of things that are going to get you sent to hell. I want you to go here first. I want you to think photo album. 
My, one of my favorite moments is of our littles, they're not little anymore, but getting, we actually have photo albums, like real ones, not just phones, but big books. And my little kids grabbing, they love to do this. Of all the things they could do, they love to get out the photo albums and put them on, just sit, see them sitting on the couch. They're so little that their legs barely go over the edge. And they put this huge book on their lap and they're like flipping it open, big page, like, who's that? Who's that? Well, that's you. No, yeah, that's you. Don't you remember this and this, this treasured moments? Are they not in your book? Photo albums, memories, pressed flowers between heavy pages, scraps of newspaper clippings, funny school pictures, the one where your hair just wouldn't quite lay down. I had a serious cowlick. Psalm 139, 17 and 18. God, how precious your thoughts are to me. How vast their sum is. If I counted them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. God's thoughts about you, God's writing about you, the story that he desires to write of your life. Beautiful moments of us with those we love and care about, of eating the best food we ever ate, of escaping the snow here in a few months and heading somewhere warm, of watching a sunset, of leaving home, of coming home, of saying hello for the first time as babies are born, celebrating at weddings, saying goodbye for the last time. He cares about those things. When I see that God has books, it's not just... Here is the record. Step forward to see. It's life. It's life. Snapshots, videos of the moments that were hard and difficult as well. When we did have to say goodbye, when we walked out of the courtroom with our marriage in pieces, all laid out in legal documents, when we left the doctor's office with bad news, when we lost the job, when we didn't get the job, when we were left out, all written in his book. Why? Because your his, his plan for your life, your ability to flourish and find joy and hope and life is found written in his book, his plans. But it is his plan, his purpose, his desire that we will follow his ways. Psalm 139, you eyes saw me when I was formless. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. And so our choice not to follow his plans, this has been written as well. Studied, weighed, considered every single moment. The dead were judged according to their works by what was written in the books. And I'm not trying to make milk toast out of God's judgment. I'm just trying to give you a broader perspective of how he sees your life. Beautiful plans and that they're perfect when we're in them and that when we stray from them, it isn't that there aren't consequences. There are, you're going to see it. But ultimately his love and his joy behind writing those things. He's not this schoolmaster that's like, don't you cross me. He loves you beautiful plans for your life. But if we say, yeah, no, thanks, out. No, I'm out. I don't want this. The dead, which is going to be all of us at some point, judged according to what's written. So then it's your turn to step before the Lord. Where are you standing? Keep asking that question and realizing I need representation. I need representation. I don't need a slick defense strategy. I need more than that. I don't need I don't need injustice where God just turns a blind eye. It's like, it's okay. No big deal. This is why when people are like, I just can't believe God would do that. You have the same reaction when you see something truly evil and dark. There's not a part of you that goes, yeah, no big deal. It's okay. You want justice. You know, what I really need is 
the pages to be rewritten that somehow take care of my stuff and rewrites my story and gives me someone else's story, but it's still my story. Is there anything like that? Is there anything like that? This is the reason I'm unafraid when I stand before the throne or actually when I stand behind the throne. I have an advocate. I have a great high priest who is pleading for me through his perfect record. My book is his book. It has been interwoven. My parts have, they're still there. It's still me, but I identify as him. I need to be in his book. The book of life is not who gets in or gets out. It is the book of Jesus. Are you in Christ? It's not a mark on the page. It's not a checkbox for eternity. Do not reduce this whole thing to one decision that you hope is enough for eternal fire insurance. Can your life thus far be reduced to one decision? Could I do that to you? No. Don't hear me saying you shouldn't make a decision to follow Jesus. You should. <laughs> you should. I believe the verse that says, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. I believe that. I think it's quite simple in what it describes. And at another level, I believe it describes something that can and should span a lifetime of faithfulness and fruit in your life. Daily saying, Jesus, today I believe you are Lord. I still believe. I confess you with my mouth and my actions. I live it out. It is the free gift of God in Jesus through grace. It's absolutely simple and amazing, but the unfolding of that gift is in a thousand different ways throughout your life, and it is of an immeasurable quality. Your life, every twist and turn, every thought before him, is it interwoven with Christ in the book of life? Because no one's able to opt out here. Nobody's able to run. Nothing you've done here will matter unless you're in his book. So what happens if your story is just your story. You haven't been interwoven. Verse 14. Death and Hades, remember what we said, personified enemies of God, were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. We all have a first death. It's the one you think about. I'm going to die. Yes, you are. There's a second death. And don't think like kind of stuff. It's just, uh, I want you to think final. Final. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And anyone, here we go with the names and the books again. It's all over this. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So this is another telling, and we've talked about this happens in Revelation. There's, it recapitulates, it retells, it's cyclical. You see stories happen again and again and again, which is why it's not a great idea to only think linear, chronological, this happened and then this happened and then this happened and this is going to be in the year blah, 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 and this is how I'll know. But that's why, it's, that's why it's, it's important not to go there. You can do it for some things, but it's cyclical because we just read in Revelation 19. I can see it right here. What happened? They were thrown into the lake of fire. Oh, didn't you just say that? Yeah. <laughs> and were there other points earlier with the bowls and the judgments where it also seemed like it was kind of the end? Yeah. Why do you keep telling us this? Yeah. Because <laughs> I want you to get it. So John is getting another angle. Scripture is giving us another view. Why does Scripture repeat things? This is one of the first questions I missed in Wheaton College Bible class on a test because I didn't study. And it was this. Jesus, it was, and it was like true or false even. I even missed a 50-50 chance of getting this question. And I still missed it. When Jesus used the words... Truly, truly, I say unto you, blah, blah, blah. He used those double thing to emphasize his point. And I was like, false. <laughs> you missed it, Chad. Standing before the throne. No, but I, 
it's sometimes repetition in Scripture is just that, to give you the severity of it. Sometimes hyperbolic language, extreme, blown-out language, like we get in Revelation, is to get you to feel, okay, this is intense. And guess what? This is intense. Fire? A lake of fire? That's intense. Anyone whose name not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So we're getting this again and again. So does this passage bother you? It should. (laughs) It should. It bothers me. It bothers me. When I read this, I have questions and concerns. When it comes to the lake, is that what I think it is, Lord? Is that what I think it is? I remember as a eight-year-old, Baptist church. This was me. This was me in church, okay? This was me. Slide down as far as possible like this. My mom tell me, sit up, and you get down as far like this. You notice, you're going to try to close my eyes <laughs> and trying to sleep because it was so boring. It was awful. Well, they brought in this one guy, and he started hooting and hollering about hell. And sure enough, It's not a Baptist church unless you have an altar call. When the altar call happened, just as I am without one plea, I was like, let's go, Dad. I want to go down. I'm crying. Why? I'm terrified of this fire, hot hell. So there's four uh, views this week on hell that I read just for you. Number one, a literal place of fire and burning. Fair enough. Can go with that. Burning. Just burning forever. Just hot. It's really hot. Number two, a place or state of final punishment described with extreme symbolic language in Scripture to make us pay attention. But still a real place. Number three, a temporary place of punishment that you can possibly work your way through. Maybe find a second chance. Dante's Inferno, anybody? Finally, a place that you were punished briefly for not being with Jesus, but then you're annihilated and it's over. Now, there are others, there are different ways to describe this, but none of us in this room actually know firsthand, (laughs) thankfully. We don't know yet. I think that's part of the purpose of scripture to get you to be thinking, but here is one thing you can know, even about those four different views. All of them agree on one thing. Hell is real. It's a real place. A real place. It's a place of final destruction. And I would add this, and you don't want to be there. You don't want to go (laughs) like that's even like if you get here and you're like, I don't understand this. I thought Hades was hell. Isn't that true? Isn't that they use that? And that's true in some of the other parts of scripture. Hades is also Sheol. It's also death. It's also personified death. It's also a personified enemy of God. And so when you hear death and Hades are thrown into the place of final destruction and judgment to experience the wrath of God forever, you see, oh, he's doing something. We get caught up in this place of, I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. So I'm not sure if it's any of it's real. What is God trying to say? What is he trying to get us to do? To get you to a place where you say, I don't want to be there. (laughs) I don't want to be there. I don't want to be apart from there, apart from him. But it's important to use biblical language the way the Bible uses it. And so this is learning curve for me, some stuff I've learned. So I'll just impart and you can see if it's helpful. Fire doesn't always mean hot in the Bible. But it does consume and it does bring destruction. Now, why would I say fire doesn't mean? Well, we have multiple verses that say God is a consuming fire. Does that mean God is hot? No. It means his very presence and his person, it will consume you one way or the other. Fire consumes changes something to a new state which cannot be reversed. So when you think about this scene, let your imagination work a little bit. Let's ask a question. Do we really want death 
and or evil and or Satan, the enemies of God, to actually have an opportunity to do all of this again in eternity. Do you want that possibility? Do you want it to be like, well, we're in heaven, but you never know. You never know what could happen. Is that my time's up? My time is up. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> you never know if they're going to come back and this whole thing will rise. Do we really want that possibility that there could be rebellion again, that there could be destruction again, that death could enter the scene again, that actually thing, everything could be flipped, that God could win, but then, oh, look, it happened. No, we want him to bring things to a final place. We want him to answer the questions of life, of evil and pain and suffering. So what God does here is irrevocable, cannot be reversed, cannot be changed. I think Jesus is trying to say it's something that can't be undone, but also must be done, must happen. Scripture is clear. God's wrath will be experienced in this place. Whatever the description is trying to tell us, we know it's bad and we know it will be forever. Now, there are plenty who will argue for the other in our denomination. We do not. We actually kind of go with what Scripture seems to say consistently that it, if you or some are raised, Jesus says, some are raised to everlasting life and some to everlasting punishment. Everybody's raised though. Everybody is raised from the dead. Evangelical Convictions, book that we, our denomination puts out, those who do not obey the gospel will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord. 2 Thessalonians 1.9. It's hard truth. But it also speaks to us to respond. Here's a quote I heard this week. Uh, from Dallas Willard uh, already passed away. In the presence of the Lord, but this kind of shook me a little bit. Heaven is for those who can stand it. I was like, what? You, got, you love it when stuff like that, somebody says something like that, and you're like, that's not, wait a minute. Heaven is for those who can stand it. I mention uh, often, but I love this book. It's short. It's not that hard to get through. I recommend it. C.S. Lewis, Great Divorce. The Damned are on a bus trip, a holiday to the lobby of heaven. They're getting to go visit. And you know what? They hate it. They hate it. They come and they see this beautiful grass and they get out and they step on the grass and they're like, ah, it hurts. And they see fruit. It looks beautiful. And they try to grab it and it weighs like a thousand pounds. They can't even lift an apple. It's because they're not made for it and because they've chosen not to accept God's gift. Some really fascinating images in that book, but ultimately, if I had to sum it up, it's this, and Lewis says this, hell is the greatest monument to human freedom. Lewis would say, nobody's there who doesn't want to be there. And you go even further, I've read some other stuff on those who are describing what it would be like in eternity. And so you might go with the literal thing. They're burning and ah, ah, gnashing of teeth. Yeah. But at the same time, scripture also shows gnashing of teeth. People who were mad at someone else. Look in Acts when they're speaking the gospel and what it says. And they gnash their teeth at us saying what? We don't want what you have. We reject what you have. So Lewis is ultimately saying that people in hell don't want out. Interesting. Romans 1, God gives them over to their desires, to what they want, and they don't want God. They want to be away from him. Jesus confirms this in the story of rich man and the Lazarus. The rich man does not ask to get out of hell. He asks for the beggar who served him to come and serve him again. He doesn't ask to get out. Well, am I in or not? It's the wrong question. Do I want Jesus or not? Is the right question. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life 
was thrown into the lake of fire, was given over to, cast into a final destruction. Destruction does not mean annihilation. Destruction just means that God is bringing it to an irreversible place that cannot be undone. And the crazy thing is they want it. Other theologians have described that people even in hell still hate him. Aren't saying, get me out of here. They still reject him. They still rebel against him. Interesting that the rich man does not have a name. But Lazarus does. Anyone whose name is written on, in his book on his hands. Luke 12, we'll finish with this. I say to you, anyone who acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge him before the angels of God. So I imagine this. My name gets called. Jesus is like, where are you? Hey, come out from behind there real quick, your little spot. Father, this is Chad. You'll see, hopefully, just kidding, <laughs> but thousands of entries, thousands of moments. Yeah, a little bleak here and there, but he kept his heart and mind and hope in me. You'll notice, Father, that they're written in between and over and around and encompassing and covering and underneath and to the side and to the left is my record. It's his now. His name is in my book. And I have those who are serving communion to come forward. Worship team, come on up too. So I'm going to read a place of communion in the Bible that is not the normal one. And here's what's interesting. I was just listening to a pastor yesterday in one of my loops around the lake. And uh, he was saying this, that we are prevented from seeing Jesus when we insist on our way and path for him to work. Let me say it in another way. You won't recognize him if you're living your expectation, your plan, your purpose. He'll be hidden. Luke 24 just took on a whole new meaning for me. The disciples on the road to Emmaus, they were prevented from seeing Jesus. He's risen. Remember to take two cups, they're stacked. So Jesus is risen from the dead. He's walking on the road. He is going after these two people who cannot see him. And why can't they see him? What do they say? Well, we had hoped. We thought that this was going to be this awesome thing. And he was going to be the Messiah and he was going to come and fix everything. And look, there's still... Rome is still in charge. It's still garbage. He died. We heard something about resurrection. We don't know, though. And what is Jesus doing in those moments? He is, one, giving the best sermon. I am checking this out of sermon library in heaven first. So I have dibs on this. I want to hear. <laughs> actually, we can listen together. We probably can have Jesus actually just tell us. What'd you say? What'd you say? But it says he took everything about himself in the whole Bible and showed them how he had to suffer. Because see, this whole lake of fire thing, it would be one thing if God was just watching to see how you did. It was just a roll of the dice to see if your life you could measure up. But what he does is he gives you life if you want it. But he will freely allow you to continue on that path of destruction if you reject as well. So they're kind of in this place. They sit down at a meal 
And I'll just read here. They came near the village where they were going and Jesus gave the impression that he wasn't going to hang out with them. He, he pretended, I love this, he pretended like he was going to keep going. Sometimes he will draw you out. But they urged him, no, 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 stay, please stay, stay with us. So he went in to stay with them. It was, and here it is, here it is. It was as he reclined at the table with them that he took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them. And it says their eyes were <gasps> opened. We recognize you now. In the broken body and the poured out shed blood of Jesus is our hope. Are you supposed to feel the severity of this moment of final eventual judgment? Yes, but where is their mercy? It hasn't happened yet. And God is offering you life. He's offering you life. So on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. He broke it. Gave it to the disciples. And said, take and eat this is my body broken for you. Let's partake together. Then he took a cup. I love to think about this moment for Jesus. I don't know if you, they poured it. Either way, somehow he had a cup in front of him and he peered down into, and I want you just to look. Imagine Jesus that night looking down into this cup, knowing exactly what it meant, knowing exactly what was about to take place. And I think there was a part of him that said, Father, finally, here we go. Here we go. He took the cup and he said, you have to drink it. You have to drink it. If you want to be in my book, you have to take this into your very being. Drink it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So you will have an advocate, so you will have representation, so that you will be with Jesus into eternity as a part of his kingdom. And so he says, drink it. Let's partake. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the verses that give us the warm fuzzies. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And God, we thank you for the verses that uh, make us kind of take a big, deep breath and say, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for allowing me to stand before your throne and be unafraid. Lord, would you minister to us as we sing one more song together? Would you take this truth and amplify it, Lord, by your spirit. Speak to us. We ask in Christ's name, amen. Hey, let's stand together.
like some help and seeing how the Lord is writing your story. It may be that you need just somebody to pray with you. We always have people up here to pray, but you may need somebody that wants to listen to your story a little bit and kind of give you some insights and maybe help you be pointed in the right direction in scripture or, and we, we call that a spiritual growth advisor around here. It's just somebody it's, you know, you're not signing in blood or anything like that. You know, maybe a one-time thing. But it also could be something where you just have somebody that you can you can call and you can hang out with and tell me about this. And, oh, I'm struggling today. Remind me again what's true. Like, so that could be you or you might need a group of people uh, to accept your quirkiness and your funniness and your inability to not say something in a group. You ever been one of those people? I am one of those people. Like when, when I'm in a group and people start talking, I'm like, oh, I can see this, I can see this. I can. So over the years, it's been like learning not to speak because I always have something to say. But getting together around the truths of who Jesus is in a small group and saying, what does that mean? What does that mean? 
How does that affect you with what I know you're struggling with, with your health? How is that helping you with the temptation that you're wrestling through? Can I, I'll pray for you. I'd love to pray for you. I'd love to have you call me when you're struggling. That's what you get in community. It's never perfect, but we, we, we see glimmers. Um, you could just need us to leave you alone, and we're fine to do that too. Um, but it's why we're here. It's why we do what we do. And so uh, let us know either way. That's, you can always stop by the next steps or talk to me or something like that. Or if you're like, I don't like to talk to people, <laughs> you can get online and uh, click on our app and just say, hey, I need, I need help. There's, there's plenty of things there. Um, I just want to thank you all also for just your investment in community in, in this place. And uh, I've been challenged recently uh, by someone outside of my circle who I know loves Jesus and just, I thought it was a really good challenge. And so I kind of committed to the Lord that I would be obedient this morning. But we ask you to talk to the Lord about your life and your resources and your time and to ask him, should I, should I give here, there, this person, this missionary, this church? And that's what we leave it at. And it, scripture is clear. Each person should decide in his heart what to give, where to give. At the same time, though, if you enjoy what God's doing here at PV, if you sense that the Lord is moving and you would say, you know what? These are my people. These are my people. I like this. I like what God's doing. Then might we ask you to make your question a little more specific to Jesus? Lord, are you asking me to give to the work of God that Pleasant Valley Church is doing? I'd ask you to do that. And if he says yes, I'd ask you to be obedient. We, we count on it. We trust him no matter what. But uh, I've, I know that it's a place, been a place of growth for me. I think I've shared before that I was in college. I was not a tither. And it was my wife who taught me how to tithe. She taught me how to be obedient to that part of scripture. I'm the one studying to be a pastor. <laughs> Just think about that for a minute. Duh, like that's kind of how I was. But it was my wife who showed me. Faith. She, was, and she didn't do it by saying, you know, you should be tithing. She was tithing. She was giving to a local church there in Wheaton, Illinois. And I was like, why are you doing that? That's all we ask. Other stuff that's going on, just grab one of those sheets, uh, check out our website or something. I will say this, we have a few names that have been submitted for our uh, Get Low and Lead Like Jesus group. If you uh, have in mind, if somebody is thinking about potentially being a leader, small group, board member for sure, we will probably start this towards the end of this year. Um, so we've got time, but don't be shy. If you see the life of Jesus in somebody, you see some of these characteristics, of humility and self-sacrificial, or you see a malleable person who could move towards those things, give us their names. We would love to talk about that. We would love to talk about the way Jesus does leadership and how he calls us to do that. Awesome. Hey, it's great to see you. Love y'all. See ya.